Well, welcome again to WordServe. My name is Pastor Bill. If I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, I'll be standing over in that vicinity afterwards. I'd love to shake your hand. And if I do know you, I'd love to catch up and see how things are going. Let me know what's going on in your world. It's been a while. Um, for those of you wondering, no, my razor is not broken. Uh, it is No Shave November. So uh, <laughs> as, as a cancer survivor, I would like to remind all men out there to get yourself checked. And uh, that's why we do what we do. All the money that I'm saving from shaving is going to a good cause. So what is that, like, I don't know, 25 cents? I, no, seriously. But that's what's going on. It'll be all good. We are continuing our sermon series calling, uh, called the Gratitude Challenge. If we've made a case already, let me, let me back up just a second. We've made a case already for how to practice gratitude and uh, how to have enduring gratitude, gratitude that keeps on going. So it's kind of been the positive for the first two. I want to give you a little bit of the negative today. I'm going to give you a negative example because sometimes we understand the importance of something when it gets taken away. If you've ever really you know, had something precious taken away, all of a sudden it becomes the most valuable thing to you. And so I want to give you an example today of where gratitude was taken away with some pretty drastic consequences. But here's the good news. When God's involved, it can always return if we return to him. So that's the good news for today. I want to uh, remind you briefly where we've been. I started off the, the first one with practicing gratitude to tell you how grateful I am for every breath I take. If you've missed that, you can always go back on our YouTube, on our Facebook, uh, or our website, wordserve.org slash sermons, and you can hear the old ones. The very first one I, I uh, talked about in this series, I talked about a time when breath got very precious to me, like just the next breath was all I could think about. And I, it, it set me up for something that helps me to never take things for granted. Now, uh, I would say that I never take anything for granted, which sounds great, but I'm human, and I slip right back into that, taking things for granted. But that one thing, that one time when I was struggling to get just the next breath, it kind of set me into a new mindset. So that I have a, a returning point. I can always go back to and go, man, I never take that for granted. What else am I taking for granted? And there's all kinds of things that we take for granted if we think about it. There's all kinds of things that are worth gratitude but slip into comfortableness or slip into just that, that underlying current of life. And we kind of forget how precious that is. We forget to say, thank you, I'm grateful. But having that one thing helps me go back and begin to analyze. So, you know, my prayer life starts to change. I start to notice little things. Uh, little things to be grateful for. Let me give you some examples. Like, man, this holiday season was such a hassle to travel. Man, it was so incredible. I couldn't get on my airplane, blah, blah, blah. That's one way to look at that. But here's another way to look at that. The fact that you had to travel tells me that you have family somewhere that loves you and wants to spend time with you. I'm grateful for that. Man, that Thanksgiving meal, it was so hard to put together all this stuff that I had to go through. And then, the, you know, the ice machine broke and the oven wasn't working right. And, dude, we have food and means to cook it. It's not like we had to go hunt our own turkey. Because I've seen some of you shoot. You would go hungry. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody else does that for us. Right? Man, I had to wake up. It was such a nice morning. I wanted to sleep in, but I had to come to church. But you can't guess where I'm going with this one. <laughs> we get to come to church. We don't have to worry about anybody storming in that door, taking us away from what we believe. We get to spend time in the presence of the creator of the universe. Have you met that guy? Who else compares to that? Who's going to raise a hallelujah compared to that? No one. This is an opportunity that is precious, but if it's taken away, you would understand how precious it is. But now, we just kind of take that for granted. How about you? Where do you take things for granted in your life? Or where do you miss opportunities to find gratitude when it doesn't quite look like you expected? Let me give you one quick example here. This is a family getting ready and sending their kids off for school. Now, let me ask you this. I know this is a posed photo because how, do, how often does this look like this in your house? <laughs> Mom's like, ha, ah. ha, Dad's like, you know, the, the kids are like, eh, little, little halos over their heads, right? Yeah, no, that doesn't ever happen, right? Maybe on the first day of school, maybe on the first day of school, or the last day of school, but yeah, every other day, it does not look like that. But can you take time to find gratitude in that? Kids are getting a free education. There's, there's things they're going to learn, they're going to grow, they're going to become, the, hopefully, 
good citizens and contribute to society. Not to mention, mom and dad, you get some time alone when they go to school. Don't tell the kids that, right? So, yeah, this isn't, this isn't reality. But in everything, like most things in life, we have a choice. We can either be grateful or we can be ungrateful. Now, is it really that simple just to make a choice? I'm going to tell you on the surface the answer is yes, it is that easy. You can make a choice. But the doing of the choice is very, very hard in some circumstances more than others. Some it's easy to give thanks and be grateful for. Some, not so much. But it is always a choice. I want to leave you empowered in that way. You have a say in this. And I want to give you an example. This is the, the non-example. We're going to go into the book of Judges today. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you've never read the book of Judges, uh, let me just say it's a roller coaster. Uh, they're up, they're down. They're up, they're down. They're up, they're down. If you did the Immerse study on the kingdoms, you know exactly what I'm talking about. This, the nation of Israel was having a tough time because they would do really well. There would be a leader, they called him a judge, that would rise up. They would bring the people to where God wanted them to be. Everything was good. They were worshiping God. And then they would kind of forget and forget to give thanks and just kind of became commonplace. And then they would slip back into the culture and they would die, take a deep dive oftentimes being uh, oppressed by other people. And then there would be another leader that would be raised up, and they would do it again. They're just up and down and up and down, and it's frustrating. I, you know who's probably most frustrated is God. It's like, hey, why can't you just do what I told you? It's like when you talk to your kids. You know, why, why can't you just do what I told you? It would be so much easier for you. And the answer is because we're human. We tend to forget. We tend to forget gratitude. We tend to forget God. And when that happens, it's a matter of time before the path takes effect and you get the effects of ingratitude. So in the book of Judges, we're going to deal with one specific story. This guy is named Samson. Samson is the strongest dude ever. Like Arnold Schwarzenegger got nothing on this guy, right? Or whoever's, I just swiped my old guy card. Anyway, uh, yeah, Arnold Schwarzenegger was get old, but he could probably still bench press a Volkswagen. Anyway, uh, so Samson has this great potential when he is born, because it's in a time when Israel is in darkness. They're being oppressed by Philistine rulers. It's not a good time to be an Israelite. They've got pressure from all sides. Uh, their former glory has not happened. Now, here's the interesting thing. The book of Judges comes before or after Joshua in the Promised Land. This is Bible trivia. After. after, right. So what happened was they had this thing, you know, where David built them all up, you know, and, and then Joshua, and we got, got the promised land. Yes, the promised land. And then you fall into the book of Judges. Is that encouraging to anyone? Does anybody feel like, raise a hallelujah for that? Yeah, no, no. But this is human nature. This is the importance of hanging on to that gratitude. We remember God. We honor him as God so that we don't fall into such terrible disarray. So, Samson, here's what happens Israel is in a time of darkness. Now, Samson's birth is heralded by an angel. Do you know how many people's births are heralded by an angel in the Bible? Did I list them? No, I didn't. Good. There, trivia question. All right, so uh, Isaac? Anybody else heralded by an angel? Jesus. There's a, there's a softball across the plate. <laughs> Pow, right? And who else? One more. Samson. <laughs> Okay, two more. <laughs> Smart guy. <laughs> yeah, John the Baptist, right? All these people are heralded by angels. Well, Samson is too. And his, he's born in Nazarite, which means he's set apart for God. So you can just kind of get the sense that people around him are going, whoa, angel told him he's coming. He's going to be in Nazarite. He's set apart for God. This is going to be a great time to be in Israel. Look at what this guy is going to do. It was the darkest of times. His name literally means sunshine. Now, I wouldn't call him that to his face, but <laughs> sunshine. Hey, sunshine, how's it going? You're here to save Israel? So in the darkness, this guy who is set apart for God, who is the bringer of light, literally, to the darkness of Israel, this have any foreshadowing for anything that's about to come later? Yeah, it sounds a lot like the light that came later, but it, he's not the Savior. <laughs> and you'll see here in a minute. So this is Samson's potential. Now, here's Samson's reality. He did whatever he saw fit. There's a, a phrase in some of your translations that he did what was right in his own eyes. Now, if you want to Google that phrase, did what was right in their own eyes, 
and then read the Bible in circles, right? You read a little bit before and a little bit after that phrase to see the context of that. I guarantee you 100% it never works out well when people do what's right in their own eyes. And Samson was among them. So the first thing that we notice is uh, he, he did what he saw fit. And one of the examples you find in Judges 14.3, uh, God had given strict instructions not to intermarry in between the religions because God recognized that the, the religions would pull them away from God and they would stray and then they would have all these problems. It's going back to why can't you just do what I told you? Samson knows this. Samson's parents know this. But Samson said, yeah, I saw this woman, this, this Philistine woman, and she looks right for me. I want you to go and get her for me. It, it was an arranged marriage contract. Kind of, that's how that worked back there. It wasn't like, you know, dead of the night, sneak them out the back door. No, not that. So he says, I, I, I like what I see. I want you to go get her for me. And so he went ahead and married her. Now, the woman is never mentioned by name, but it, it leads to a disagreement that ends up in uh, him losing the wife, him killing uh, several people, um, lots of other discord and things went on because of his temper, and, and all the other things that happened were not good, not good at all. So what does he do? Well, then he goes and he visits a, a woman of the night in a city called Gaza. That might ring a bell today, right? Now, it wasn't like he just woke up one day and decided that he was going to go do these weird things. Uh, Pastor Craig Rochelle says it this way, 56,250. That's the number you need to remember, 56,250, because that's how many steps Samson had to take to travel to the city of Gaza to spend that night with that woman. You think he had time to think about that? You had time to think about what was right? Time to think about God? But... 56,250 steps, and, and folks in our journey, in our spiritual journey, we take a few steps, maybe we take 56,250 steps, but they're all in deliberately a wrong direction, I guarantee the results are not going to be good if we do what is right in our own eyes. The story gets better, because after that, he is attracted to this woman called Delilah. This is the, this is the one that you'll recognize from the Bible story, Samson and Delilah. Well, you would think that Samson had caught on by now because his track record with wives and women had not been so good. But in this case, Delilah is asking him, what is the source of your strength? And it's not like she asks and he says something and she goes, oh, no, that's not it. What is it? Listen to what happens. She sets him up. I'm not going to read the whole account. I'll, I'll read just a little bit of it for you. She sets him up with Philistines in the room. So what's the source of your strength? Oh, well, if you tie me with these new cords, then I'll be as weak as any other man. So she waits for him to go to sleep, ties him up, and there's Philistines waiting in hiding in the room. And she says, Samson, wake up. The Philistines are upon you. And he just snaps them like they're nothing. It's like, oh, well, that wasn't it. Three times she sets him up. Three times he gets out. And finally, we come to this section in Judges 16, 15 through 19, I'm just going to read this for you. This is the fourth time. It's not the third time it's a charm. It's the fourth time. So he has been uh, lying to her. He has not been sharing the secrets of his supernatural strength. And it comes down to this. Then she said to him, this is Delilah talking to Samson, how can you say I love you when you won't confide in me? This is the third time you have made a fool of me and haven't told me the secret of your great strength. With such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was tired to death. Some things never change. <laughs> so he told her everything. <laughs> no razor has ever been used on my head. I was talking about men nagging women, just in case. You know. uh, so he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I have been a Nazarite dedicated to God from my mother's womb. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me, and I would be like any other man. So Delilah saw that he had told her everything. She sent word to the rulers of the Philistines, come back once more. He has told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with silver in their hands. Having put him to sleep on her lap, she called for someone to shave off the seven braids of his hair and so began to subdue him. And here's the crushing result. And his strength left him. 
These are the words of God for the people of God. And for these words, we are grateful. And his strength left him. Why? Because he wanted to please Delilah more than he wanted to please God. Because while he was set apart for God, he set God apart. He had no place for him. Delilah was the most important thing at that moment. Now, if you know the rest of the story, it's not a happy, happy story. He is as ordinary as any other man. He is taken hostage. He's immediately blinded. They take his eyesight. And he's chained to grind the mill, just walking around with a heavy stone, pushing it day after day. That's the darkness in the light of Israel. That's the sunshine, the bringer of light. That's the one set apart by God, declared by angels. Why? Did God change his mind? Did God say, you know, I'm going to set you up for great things, and then I'm just going to pull the rug out from under you? No, it was Samson that forgot God. Samson began to walk 56,250 steps in the wrong direction and continued to do so. Now, why does this matter? Why do I say this? Well, if, you, if we go back and we look now at where we've been, it matters because in Romans 1, 21 through 23, we see the impact of not giving thanks. We talked about this briefly last time. Let me review it with you just real quick. Romans 1, 21 through 23. For all they knew, although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. Does this sound like Samson? Yeah, Samson was God to Samson. There was no God for Samson. I guess when you're that strong, you can get a pretty big head about that. But Samson didn't need anybody. And Samson did what was right in his own eyes. Neither glorified him nor gave thanks to him. So here's the result. Their thinking became futile. Their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the glory of the mortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. They exchanged the glory of the creator of the universe for created things. I'm so glad we don't do that today. Aren't you? This is what happens. So his mind has been changed. Futile thinking means it comes to no point. There's no, like, why can't you just do what I said? Because my mind is futile. I can't even comprehend what you're asking. I'm so far removed from your way of thinking that it doesn't make sense to me. And my heart is darkened. Well, that's never a good thing. The heart is the center of everything that you are. There's so much darkness that the light can't get through. He's not listening for God's voice. And his wisdom is actually folly. And here's the hard part, exchanging truth for lies. He did what was his own truth. She's right for me. This is right for me. That's my truth. What's your truth? That's a phrase that I hear often today in talk shows and in other things. Well, my truth is, well, if your truth isn't God's truth, I got sad news for us. It's not truth. It's small t truth. God's truth is capital T truth. It is unbending. It is unchanging. That's why he's God. He knows these things. When we separate ourselves from the truth, we walk from the solid rock into the shaky sand. And we may last for a while, as long as nothing drastic happens. But whose life doesn't have things happen? Right? We need to be on that solid rock, that capital T truth. So my favorite question, uh, to, to what end? What is all this going to result in? There we go. Here's the scariest part of all. As we continue to read in Romans 128, <clears throat> this futile thinking, this darkened heart, this exchanging truth for lie, here's the path that that leads down. It just, I'll continue to read. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind. Now, let me pause here for just a second. God gave them over. So many times we see God as this person up there sitting on a throne. He's just ready to smite you, right? He's just going to take it to you when you do something wrong. Just waiting for you to step across that line, whack. That's not the way it works. 
way it works is you persist in wanting this thing. You persist in not paying attention to me. Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to give you exactly what you want. Sounds like heaven, but it's not. Not when your mind is futile and your heart is darkened. I'm going to give you over to exactly what you want. That frightens me because I want what God wants. And if I ever ask anything independent of that, I hope I got a still small voice or a loud hallelujah, whatever, telling me that is not the way to go, my friend. Wrong direction. Try again. Because bad things happen. So what bad things happen? <clears throat> uh, well, you get a depraved mind. Here's some uh, examples of what depraved minds do. There is no fruit or there's bad fruit. We're talking spiritual in this sense, but this is what societies and families and marriages and everything is built on, this fruit that we talk about. But how is that relationship going to look? How is your family? How is your spouse? How are your children? How is your community, your nation, your world going to look if there is no fruit or bad fruit? Well, you're going to look malnourished. And as I look at the world today, you can see signs of spiritual malnourishment. It's all around us. And if I'm honest, sometimes it's us. But there's hope. They're opposed to the truth with the depraved mind. They can't understand what capital T truth means. So you hear all kinds of crazy things. They indulge in sin. Now, if you indulge in a meal, what does that mean? It's not like you just eat and you're done. It's like, no, you indulge. You're all in. These people are all in to sin, all in to going 56,250 steps. You have to be all in to walk 56,250 steps. Right? At some point, you hope there would be a turnaround. And here's the, the scary part that I, I, I don't want this world for me. I don't want this world for my children or my grandchildren. There is no mercy. There is no love. There is no faithfulness. What is there to build on? Doesn't this sound cheery? Isn't this awesome? Right after Thanksgiving? And that's the point. This all starts with a lack of acknowledging God and a lack of giving thanks. This is where it leads. So is it gratitude important? Yeah, absolutely. I'll continue here because here's what happens. They become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossip, slanders, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, shall I go on? Yes, and boastful. <laughs> they disobey their parents. Uh-oh, kids. Sorry to out you there. Uh, they have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. And all they know, although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but they approve of those who practice them. You don't have to look very far to see this going on today. You can see it on the news. You can see it when you flip open your news channel or your news reader. People out there that are denying the truth actively. It's frightening. It's absolutely frightening, and it all goes back to this idea of gratitude. So how do we get back on the road to gratitude? I'm going to give you three S's that will get us back on the road to gratitude. And the first one is sovereign. God is sovereign. Think about that for just a second. Who else is that sovereign? Who else is the creator of the universe? Answer, nobody. God knows are you going to compare our wisdom with the wisdom of the one who created the universe? Look around. How could there be all of this without intelligent design? I'm baffled. Yet I will go up against that and say, I know better than him. Now, that, that's frightening to me. God is sovereign. God is in control. The other S that I would give to, to remind us is source. God is the source of what? Well, for starters, He's a source of salvation. I don't know if you've heard about his son, Jesus Christ, sent on the hill of Cal Calvary, died on a cross, buried dead and risen. Ri risen? <laughs> risen. <laughs> risen is a wine. Uh, risen, yeah. That's the one. He's the source of that. Now, if you think, man, nah, I don't really need a savior. I'm a pretty good person. That I would suggest that maybe we don't really realize what we're up against. We need a savior. We need a savior desperately. And God provided. God is the source of that. Here's the other thing that God is a source of. God is a source of everything that he has poured into you. He knit you in the mother's womb. Fearfully and wonderfully made you are. He has poured gifts into you. 
and not just gifts from the womb, but he's given you life experiences. He's given you people that have encountered, that you have encountered that have shaped you. He's given you a heart. He's given you personality. He's given you all of these things. These are gifts. So he is the source of that. Whatever it is that you're using to, whatever your goal is, make fame, make money, I want to be known, whatever that is, who gave you all that? God. God is the source of that. And for that, we can be grateful. But so often, we're not. And Samson is a perfect example. Who made him the strongest guy on earth? That would be God. But was he thankful? Did he honor God in that? Not so much. What gift do you have? And what are you using it for? Because that brings us to the last S. Steward. This is our role in this. We talked a little bit about this with the slant last week, but consider this. All the gifts that you have been given, all the experiences that God has poured into you, the personality, the heart, the passions that he has given you, those are gifts. But here's the thing about God's gifts. God's gifts are given through us, not to us. There's a big difference. If God gives gifts to us, well, that's mine. I can do whatever I want with it. No, God gives gifts through us. Our job is to simply pass that on, whatever that is. If you're struggling, well, I don't know that I have any gifts. I don't know that I have anything that I can give to God. Come and talk to me. I, I would love to sit down and hear your story, and I guarantee you that you have gifts. You have passions. You have heart for things. You have personality. You can do things that I can't and vice versa. That's the way the body of Christ is put together. It's not anything to be ashamed of or proud of. We're all different for a reason. That makes the strongest, most well-rounded body. So, yeah, we are stewards, and we have gifts that are given through us, not to us. So, how can you practice gratitude? Quick review. How many people have practiced box breathing? Is it working? Mixed review? Okay. I'd love to hear some feedback. and You don't have to like shout it out now, but I would love to hear some of the feedback from some of the things that we've been doing. How about breath prayers? Anybody been trying breath prayers? Again, you can go back on the, uh, the feed. Good, bad, indifferent. Mm, yeah. So it takes, everything takes practice, right? Everything takes practice. Uh, how about journaling? Anybody journaling? I wrote five words this morning. <laughs> God, thank you for today. Yeah. <laughs> No, journaling is a great idea because in the moment you don't always see God at work, but later when you go back and you read what you've read or what you've written, you can see where God was at work. So I encourage it. And, and, and I want to do a check here because on the very first day I ask you to rate your, your gratitude on a scale from 1 to 10. 1, I am the least grateful person in the world. 10, I am the most grateful person in the world. So I had to write a number down. Then I had to go back and say, anxiety, I'm the least anxious person in the world, I'm the most anxious person in the world. I had to write a number down. And I ask you to keep track of that over the next three weeks. So here's what I was looking for. Did anybody see that the more grateful you are, the less anxious you are? All right, three of you are on a roll. Four, all right, four, my final offer, four, four. Do I hear four? Yeah, give me five, give me five, give me five, yeah. No, so what I'm trying to do is, is show the relationship that the more we focus on gratitude, the less anxiety we have. We talked about this in the second week where Paul tells us to be anxious about nothing, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. 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 Present your request to God. That's why. It's, it's science. Go listen to number two. So here's the thing. We're going to see what we're looking for. Just like I said before, oh, I had to travel. Well, are you looking for the hassle or are you looking for the family that loves you? Because there's your gratitude. Oh, I had to make this dinner. It was so terrible. Oh, well, you have food. You have something to cook it with. You have something to store it in. You, you, you don't have to. <laughs> quesadillas, is that what you said? No, I said it tasted good. Oh, and it tasted good. Well, that depends. <laughs> Mine tasted great. <laughs> I would hear about that later. Yeah. I had to come to church today. Well, I hope you've had a counter with the creator of the universe. I hope you understand how much he loves you. I hope you understand what he's already done for us, what he's doing for us right now, what he will do for us as we honor him and give him thanks. I hope it changes your life. I hope it changes your relationships. I hope it changes your world. That's what's possible. 
But here's often what happens, just like Samson. I don't know if you notice that this looks like a pretty strong dude, but this is at the end of Samson's story. What you may not or may not realize is he is chained to pillars in the temple of Dagon. He's blinded. He can't see. His last request is, God, please return my strength to me. And what's he end up doing with that? He ends up toppling the temple. He kills several thousand people, including all the key elite leaders of the society of the day. Now, is that what God wanted, to bring Israel light, to lift the oppression? No, probably not. I don't know. I'm not God. I can't say that. But I can't help but wonder, what if? What if Samson had honored God? What if Samson had been grateful? What might have God done through him? Now, eventually the Philistine oppression was lifted and Israel raised up with another judge. As you can keep reading the story. But how many people had to suffer in the meantime because Samson became his own God and was not thankful? How many people are waiting for your gift to come alive? How many people are waiting for you to do your part in the body of Christ? Whatever that is, don't think it's too small. Nothing is too small in the hands of God. How many people are looking for what you have to be given to the, the body of Christ? I say that not to put guilt on you, but to recognize this is an opportunity, folks. And if God is behind it, nothing can stop it. What would you do if you knew that you couldn't lose? That question is possible when God energizes that gift in you with honor and thanks. So it is a choice. We can choose to be grateful. We can choose to be ungrateful. I just want you to understand the ramifications between the two. Because ungratefulness leads to a world, you heard about it, envy, strife, murder, malice, exchanging truth for a lie, worshiping the created instead of the creator. All of that happens without thankfulness. But here is the hope. If all of that is true, if all of that happens when we're not thankful, then the inverse must also be true. If I honor God, if I am thankful, We'll have life. We'll have light.